те люди, которые, которые сейчас, может быть, как-то вовлечены в церковную жизнь, или, по крайней мере, слышали о ней и знают о ней, то, видимо, видимо They obviously know the following, that today, on Friday, the cross-worshipping week is coming to an end. This week is the middle of the land, three weeks before it, and then three weeks after it. The cross-worshipping week. What is it? What are we talking about? And why did the church establish it? The reason is quite practical indeed. The land is quite long. It's almost 50 days long. And especially the first three weeks are very hard for a person, especially if they live according to the land. It is not easy at all, because the land it calls for a person not just to abstain from meat, milk, products, but even from fish, but that's just about the stomach. And the stomach, as you all know, we all know very well, according to John Kalimakas, you remember his 14th step in the letter of divine ascent on the glamorous yet wicked master, the stomach. And here, three weeks of fighting with this glamorous yet wicked master of all, the stomach. So this cross-worshipping week calls us after three weeks of land to rejoice. Why? Why is it called the cross-worshipping week? On Saturday, on last Saturday before it, there is a special evening service when the cross is being carried out of the altar and there is a special church worshipping of a cross. At this time, the special prayers are said, and people even bow to earth in front of the cross, the cross which is the symbol of our salvation, and everyone bows to earth, and that's it. Then the other prayers are said, and the week comes to an end, as well as the service, and we keep on living. And what is it? What is the worshipping of the cross? Are we talking about just about bowing low or about kneeling in front of the cross. These are just the signs of our reverence and faith. But what are these signs? What do they call us to? What do they speak of? The cross consists of two crossbars, vertical and horizontal. And what do they symbolize? When we talk about the cross, what do we speak about? The cross means the sufferings that we have to endure in the course of our life. This may be outer sufferings, our inside sufferings, perhaps some illnesses, etc. And they say, this is our cross. Indeed it is. It is something happening despite us, something that we have to accept passively. It is what it is. But even in this regard, how differently a person can take it all. What does the church call us to? The sufferings happen to everyone. How should we take them? It turns out there are three steps how we can take the sufferings, how we can accept it, and three steps of our attitude. The first one is the lowest and the easiest one. We should tolerate. Yes, something happened. We should tolerate. We shouldn't blame it on anyone. The second step is much more serious 
and very, very important. The Church explains that the second step is the following. From the Christian point of view, Nothing happens in our life incidentally or by chance. Everything that happens happens according to God's providence, which corresponds to our state of soul. The state of our soul changes a lot. The same as weather. Sometimes it's sunny, sometimes it's cloudy. Sometimes I'm so loving, ready to help, smiling, and the other day I'm so irritated and I just can't bear being close to anyone. So we change a lot. And what's happening here? What is the conclusion? There are no accidents. And here, everything that happens to us is not an accident. And it's not just something that evil people or enemies did to us. No. It is very important to understand from the Christian standpoint, as Reverend Isaac Siren said, Nobody and nothing, and he enumerates neither reptiles, nor animals, or birds, or demons, or people, or angels. Nobody can harm us. Nobody with a loving and wise God's will. What does the Christianity say? Just Think about it. It's so great. Nobody can harm us. Let's live along all the people who are afraid of all the superstitions, like the cat crosses the road or anything. It is ridiculous. Nobody can harm us without God's will. And the God's will always corresponds to our state of soul in the same way as a doctor, a wise and experienced doctor, Prescribe us what? In full accordance to our state. Sometimes he says, you need to eat honey or to go to a resort. It is so great. And sometimes they say, you need to be operated immediately. Is he a bandit? A doctor, is he a bandit? No, we pay money, but please operate. Do you understand? It turns out everything that happens to us happens in accordance to our spiritual state. So the second step is as follows. If someone wishes and understands how you should tolerate the sufferings in the Christian way, they should say, I get what I deserve. How blessed is the person who realizes this? They take off a huge burden of themselves, the burden of offense, offense against people, obstacles, perhaps even God. I get what I deserve. Oh, my Lord, forgive me. How blessed is this person and how it is good for their soul. This should be told from our heart. Please remember who was the bandit crucified to the right of Jesus Christ. A bandit. And you know, even he himself told that he got what he deserved, but having realized it, just look what he received. Having realized it, he said, Oh Lord, remember me in your kingdom. I get what I deserve. This horrible crucifixion, if you read about it, it can't get any worse. And at this moment, he said, I get what I deserve. 
he was told, today you will be in heaven with me. And when Jesus Christ said it, he didn't mean that the bandit would move from one planet to a different planet. Where is the kingdom of heaven? Christ told, the kingdom of heaven is inside a person, is inside you. Not somewhere, somewhere elsewhere, but inside you. It is hidden there, but you can only get it when at long last you realize a very simple thing. Nothing happens accidentally. You have no enemies, even if they want to kill you. These are senseless tools of God's will. But unless God allows it, nobody will ever do anything to you. So the second step, I get what I deserve. How blessed is a person who realizes it. If a person takes a look at their life, not just at their deeds, sometimes we can't do something, but we should take a look at our intentions, at our hypocrisy, at our aims, at our deception, at our dreams. And then a person indeed will realize, I get what I deserve. This state, this state, is actually the state that can be expressed by one simple notion. It is the state of humility, which is the realization of who I am indeed. Not just some dreams that I am the best in the whole world, but indeed, and the person who realizes that is blessed. So we should say, I get what I deserve. There is this third step. This third step, that is, of course, impossible without the second step. But not everyone can reach, climb the step. But that would be so great if someone could. The third step is when a person sees they are getting what they deserve, even if their house was burned, if they broke their arm, if something happened to their child, if they have problems at work, and they say, I get what I deserve. But not just that, but the person can from all their heart say, Oh Lord, thank you. I thank you for giving me a chance, at least with these sufferings, at least to some small extent to get cured from all the sins that I have inside me, from all the diseases with which I am infected. This is the horizontal crossbar of the cross. Horizontal. You know, that is parallel to Earth. This is sufferings, misunderstandings, offenses. These are all a horizontal crossbar of the cross. But the cross, not just one bar, so this cross worshiping week, we remember the vertical bar as well. So there are two bars. So what is the vertical cross bar? If we can deal with the first cross bar somehow, but it's not so easy. But the vertical, what is it? It is, maybe, what I'll say will be too high flown, and nowadays it is not so simple, but this is urging yourself to the personal exploit, urging yourself to live to live a holy life. It is so difficult. The personal exploit is very complicated. Even a person who can reach the second step, and of course the third step, someone who can thank God when they suffer hard, 
Переживание рая внутри человека. So the paradise Heaven and hell вот are inside our hearts, себя. and this self-realization and gratitude to God, they give paradise to, to everyone, and how close the paradise is to each of us, and how we do not use our opportunity to get it. Is it so difficult to understand that I get what I deserve? Unless someone actually insane or proud can say, why God, why are you doing this to me? Just take a look at my neighbor. He is so much worse than I am. So who could ever think that the, pers the first person to enter the kingdom of heaven would be a bandit? Nobody could ever think of it in the history of the mankind. The Christianity made this great discovery that you can get united with God by means of realization of who we are in reality, but not just in our dreams. So the second vertical crossbar calls us to what? It calls us to do something from ourselves. What can we do? We can help someone. We can not offend someone who is trying to offend us. We should say a few Jesus' prayers per day, like five, ten, twenty. Just bow a few times from all your heart in front of God. Just abstain from some entertainment or this TV, pathetic TV or internet, at least for some time, at least in the course of this week, the cross-worshipping week, we bow to which Christ cross. Here is what we bow to. We bow to God's love and mercy. God is ready to give us everything if indeed we realize what we should realize according to the first horizontal and the second vertical crossbars. We should urge us to live according to the gospel and its commandments. It is often thought that The life according to gospel, it is the Christian specifics. I'm sorry, but it is so stupid. Maybe it is simply ignorance or both, I don't know. The law of Archimedes, is it just for Archimedes? Gravitation, is it just for Newton? He discovered it so, or are this just universal laws? The Christianity discovered the spiritual laws for the mankind, for every person, not just for a Christian. So a Christian is some, someone who knows these laws and lives according to them. Christians know the right way of life, what is good, here is what Christianity is about. These are the universal laws, and not just the specific laws for some small group of people who call themselves Christians. No, these are the world laws of life. If only all the people accepted and understood that God That first of all, there is God, and that He is love. That He is a doctor, and He never punishes. If they understood that everything happens, not just because God wanted and then punished us. No. God is just love. If only we understood it, How our life would be different, how different our inside character would be, how happy everyone would be, understanding that it depends on me, everything depends on me. I should change my life. How can I change it? 
by means of repentance. No other religion, you know, knows repentance. Can you imagine this? We have repentance. Such an opportunity to change ourselves from Greek, the word repentance, metania, means change. A person should change or at least to reject with their mind and heart all the sins. You should at least try to redirect your life to a different way. And then you will see what you will receive in your own life and in life of all the people who surround you. So when church established this cross worship in a week, here is what was meant. Sometimes people just bow to earth and nothing, and they do not understand what we, we bow to, Божий, we bow to God's love that opened us the way to what? To our own good. good. To our own good. Here is what we bow to. That's how we should take the cross that we worship. We should tolerate all the sufferings with gratitude and at least to some small extent we should make ourselves look up to the sky from earth. Then a person will receive the good that they couldn't even think of. As one soul says, you should try and you will see how good God is. So my two hours have come to an end. This was my introductory word. I want just to say something regarding the time we are living at and now, orally, in the written form, or somehow else, you can ask me questions. That's how I decided. We have so many questions in our life. So many. Sometimes it is not easy to answer them or even to think them, analyze them. But first, please, no political questions. I'm not a politician. Please don't ask me about Putin or Obama. Oh my God. Really, why would I care about Putin or Obama? When I become some minister or ambassador, I will answer the questions. But I have nothing to do with politics right now. About economy, please, the same thing. I'm just a theologian. So, not an economist, and I'm not a philosopher, because philosophers like to talk so much, keep talking and talking, and, you know, what is the mistake of philosophy? I can't help saying. They, first of all, should understand that the basic notions that we use have an undetermined character. We say, a person's soul, what is it? We say, eternity, what is it? Time, how can we understand it? And all these categories, they are so vague. And out of these vague categories, we are trying to make some conclusions. So it's like fortune teller telling. Really, um, I, I beg your pardon, all the philosophers, because I, I was very fond of philosophy some time ago. Uh, so then I realized that all the categories are so vague. Geisenberg, a very famous physician and philosopher who has a book physics and philosophy, and what he writes there, this is something I like so much. He expressed the idea, he said, as all the notions that we use cannot be exactly defined, consequently, with the rational judgment, we can never come to the absolute truth. 
Love, what is it? Death, what is it? Eternity, how can we understand it? And it's endless. And we are trying to operate with these notions, and the vaguer it gets, the more high flown it sounds. And we say, oh, he's so smart. So, so you see, I'm saying this is that I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a politician, and not an economist, and so on. And the questions connected with the religion, of course, we should discuss. Okay, let's start. You're welcome. No, the attitude to exorcism of modern priests, you provide an example of Saint Sergei of Radenish, who in his life had only two cases when he outed demons, and gospel from Lucas you can read. And he said, Lord, we saw a person who could out demons with your name, and we didn't allow him because he wasn't following us. And Jesus Christ told him, allow him, because who is not against us, they're for us. So please, comment on this. I understood your question. How is it connected with the exorcism? and with your negative attitude to it. Thank you. We shouldn't forget that when we hear the words of Jesus Christ, we should understand one thing. He saw people and their souls. And when often he spoke of someone, he spoke out of this scene. Now they speak about people who heard Jesus Christ, who accepted his teaching, who didn't physically follow him, Jesus Christ, but they followed his teaching. And that's why he said, you can allow them. He knew who he was talking about, but there is a different place in Gospel. Who is not with us, they are against us. You should have provided both places. It's not for nothing that they say when we try to explain Gospel, we should take all the so-called parallel places where in Gospel the same thing, topic is discussed. And out of this context, sometimes even contradictory, we can understand the general thought and idea. Jesus Christ told that who doesn't eat my flesh and doesn't drink my blood has no eternal life. Is it said? It is. Did the right bandit receive communion? He wasn't baptized, he didn't receive communion. You will be in heaven with me today. And the Holy Father is explaining. Saint Macarius the Great explains that this word should be understood in a spiritual way, but not in the direct way as some people thought. And they left Christ because they didn't understand the words of Christ. You should, take, you should keep in mind that there are many parables in Gospel. That's why we should turn to Holy Fathers, how they understood different places of Gospel. Why do we turn to Holy Fathers? Because they, being enlightened with the same Holy Spirit that the Gospel is written with, they could indicate the exact meaning. It is the direct contradiction. Who doesn't eat and drink has no eternal life. You will be in heaven with me today. You see, here is the same example. Thank you. In our city, we have a great cult of Jehovah's Witnesses. These people meet us in the street, come to our homes. Please tell us why this cult is destructive and how we can talk to these people and why the Orthodox Church does nothing 
about ну, this first, что не борется, about doing боитесь, nothing. You are не on, you just don't know. Ну, книги, We have many books about it. Against Dworkin, cults, например, for instance, by Dworkin, who explains the essence of uh, this cult and how they work and manipulate and about their teaching. So, about the essence, you shouldn't be surprised. These are Judaism who started fighting against Christ, having crucified him, and then their activity was the following. You can remember Saul, who later became Apostle Paul. They went across the cities and towns, captured people, and made them reject their faith, killed people. So these are the same Judaism. What do they claim? That the basic Holy Scripture is the Old Testament, and the New Testament, it's not God. Why? Ask them why. They do not know why. They reject the main truth of the Christian faith, of the revelation that actually was unbelievable for the whole world. They make it come down to Judaism, to some primitive Old Testament basic elementary teaching, Apostle Paul said, this is old, and old is close to destruction. All the Old Testament was what? It was the prophecy of the upcoming Savior, and then he came, and now what started fighting against him. The, the, uh, the Savior was crucified. And the Judaism, we also had them in the Russian Empire in the 15th century. You can remember it from the history of church. This was a heresy. They were against icons, sacraments. They said Christ is not a God. And it was so terrible, even Metropolitan had some doubts, as well as Tsar. So Thank God there were great priests who could stand up against it. And so, Chikova's witnesses are a continuation of the chain of attempts to make us come back to the Old Testament. Can you think of the Old Testament? It is just a disaster, and to some extent, maybe they reach their goal, they can actually throw somebody off track and make some people get into their system, but you should understand, yes, there was the Old Testament, but the New Testament came, and why the New Testament is true? On it, you know, there are so many proofs of such a kind that it, it is just very surprising when you get again acquainted to this. First, you should read the, uh, what Apostle Paul writes to Jews. There are such explanations of it all, and outside of the Holy Scripture, you can look at Christianity from the point of view of how it is proved, you will be surprised. The Christianity is the unique religion that has the objective arguments in favor of its divine revelation and divine origins. Not just I believe, but the objective arguments, independent, regardless of my inner belief, Christianity has it, but other religions, there are no proofs of the kind. This is a very serious argument, proofs how we can just reject all the attempts of different Jehovah's Witnesses and the like. Can we pray in a church where the priest has a formal attitude to the service, he's trying to make it shorter and he speaks too fast? Or maybe we should change the church. 
Ну, вы знаете, общий you know, the general advice is as follows. Выбора, If you have an opportunity храм, of church, you should go to church that you like better. It is natural. Who makes us? Sometimes both priests are good, but this one I like better. There's some harmony. Okay, no problem. We do not mind. We have many acquaintances. With some we can talk for hours. And with others you can't even talk for a few minutes. There's some harmony and there is no harmony. And it's the same here. There is no sin when we choose what corresponds better to our soul. There is no sin if if we have a choice, but it's much worse when we have no choice. It is very sad indeed. But I should tell you, you shouldn't worry about the services being shortened. It is a pity, but it's not the worst thing. You should understand why it is happening. You know why? I will open your secret. Not because he is bad, but because I am bad. Here, what it is about, we are bad. You know, the Russian proverb says that according to a person, they have their hat. So we should remember that. The problem is that all the people surrounded, surrounding me are terrible. I can't find a single normal person around me. And only I am such a purified and innocent person. Well, this is a disaster. We should understand. Nothing happens by chance. So I hope that at least on this short service, I will really pray and not just dream and travel in my thoughts throughout the world. Вот, вот вы написали записку, you wrote a note. Just take a look, at least at this short service. Do you pray? What are you doing? Are you judging someone? And the priest and someone else, and there are some dreams and some sins in our thoughts. If only in the course of this short service we prayed, then God would make this priest to make normal services. So let's not worry, but let's pay attention to ourselves and try as hard as we can to get used to prayer. We should learn how to pray. We should learn how to pray. Everybody thinks you can pray, and this is as simple as that. It's the same as you say, come up to the piano and play it. But how can I do this? I never touch the piano. But you come up and play. Oh, you can't. You can't. So interesting. And you think you can pray. A person who doesn't try to learn to pray will never actually pray. How can we learn to pray? When it is calm, nobody distracts us from all your heart with full concentration, with full concentration, reverence. You should say, O Lord Jesus Christ, Please have mercy on me. You say it once, you say, say it two times, and the third time, you see, you start thinking about something else. And you should make yourself concentrate again. And that's how you learn. So we think we're orthodox, but we do not pray. If all our prayers come down to just reading something without concentration or feeling, we just lie to ourselves. It is self-deception. If we learn, starting from our free time, in good conditions, our life will be changed by God. There is the law that the Spirit defines all the forms, so the spiritual state actually defines the outer forms, and we start asking God for the outer forms when we have no 
in our state. We are so wrong. You remember in the Russian Empire there were thousands of monasteries and spiritual schools and monks and priests. And what did our saints say about the spiritual state in Russia? Do you know what? They were actually crying. Crying about the spiritual state of the clergy, monks, nuns, theological schools and academies. That's why the revolution in 1917 took place. Not because of some enemies, they were just tools, but from inside we were rotten. It was inner decay, so we shouldn't worry about this. Clergy should worry about this. You can turn to clergy, but first you should remember that our spiritual state defines all our outer life. This is the law. It happens that it is impossible to concentrate and pray attentively. Please tell me, should I make myself pray in such cases? You know, the Holy Fathers say that especially God accepts the prayer when a person doesn't want to pray, when all the soul is against praying, when your heart is like a stone, God accepts this prayer. And when God gives you and you're ready like to fly to heaven, anyone would pray in this case, anyone. There is no dignity or anything. We should show our loyalty in this predicament, in this difficult case. With my mind, I understand. My heart is like a stone. But please, my Lord, have mercy on me. And experience proves that if a person prays like this, very soon the person will be relieved from their heart like a stone and will be so blessed that they will remember it. The question is as follows. In 2013, a documentary movie by Galina Tsarova was released. God is betrayed by silence. Please tell your attitude towards it. And what is the state of orthodoxy today? I didn't watch the, this movie. You know, very seldom I watch movies, maybe once in ten years. So, you know, the main movies is something I uh, do not watch and they go beyond me. Unfortunately, I can't comment on it, but I think we should be very careful to these this announcements in public, because sometimes we are very inclined to, to make someone a saint, I mean, like to believe someone is holy. There are some doubtful things. For instance, when we say someone is a little bit nice and they say good things, but no, we say they are saint. We do not know the measure. This is our mistake. Good is good and saint is absolutely different by act. Unfortunately, I can't comment. I'm sorry, I didn't watch it. You said I have an orthodox viewpoint. Does it mean you're a believer? Okay, <laughs> this is a nice question. In short, you know, even demons believe and they stay demons. So if you just agree with the orthodox teaching that Christ came, he is risen, but my life is not, is, does not correspond to the commandments of Jesus Christ. I'm not orthodox. The person is orthodox only if they strive to live according to the commandments of gospel. And if they do not live according to gospel, they can be 
a professor, a PhD in theology, a metropolitan three times, but they are not orthodox if they do not live in the orthodox way. So only our attempts to live in the orthodox way. Why did God create Adam and Eve? If Eve wasn't tempted by the snake and wouldn't seen uh, Adam and Eve would keep living in paradise, what was wrong with that? <laughs> and I will go on. Please don't go on. Okay, stop it. Stop it. Thank you. I get the direction of your thought. The question. No, no, I understood the question. It wasn't a question, it was just some introductory word. Can I just answer your introductory word, please? We do not understand anything. What God was thinking, what is eternity, what plans he had, and what would be if only this is the wrong way to put a question. We are trying to fortune, tell something, predict something, what would be if this is the wrong question. We should, out of what we have, we should understand if God did something, this is the only real and necessary for us. And what would be? Well, there are many ways of answering, but let's leave it alone. What is spiritual celesty? The spiritual celesty is when a person aims to get spiritual pleasures. And it is the sense of their personal exploit and the sense of the Christian life is this aspiration to get some, some blessed pleasures. The Holy Father say it is the state of self-flattery, since said that premature, passionless state is dangerous, and premature God's pleasures are very dangerous as well, because they are not actually from God. So in our physical life, a person can strive for pleasures in the spiritual life, they can also strive for pleasures. It is possible, it is simple hedonism, and many people who actually went along this way perished or like fell spiritually, so they destructed their soul, because a person doesn't yet know their soul from inside. They are not aware of their sins, but they already want some pleasures. It's dangerous. So how should a priest preach the church course for it to be useful? It is such a difficult question. Preaching is not so easy. You know, some people have a talent for sermons. For speeches, some are capable of it, and they do it well. Others are incapable. There are very nice people or priests incapable of sermons at all. I witnessed such a case when one priest, a very nice, pleasant, sincere person, and he couldn't actually preach. He was mumbling, stumbling, and it was impossible to listen to. So, what do you mean, how to preach? Everything depends on both talent and knowledge, of course. You can't just preach about anything. You should indeed learn all the time. God forbid if someone thinks out of priests or teachers that they have already learned everything. As the famous proverb goes, descended decimus, while teaching I am learning, as ancient Romans said. So a professor, a teacher, a priest who stopped studying and learning themselves 
will вот, very что, soon надо, say nothing worthwhile. So every priest should read. Maybe they should read sermons, proper sermons, in order to see what they should speak of so from these good sermons. So this is a very, very vague conversation. You're welcome. What is a prayer? How should we pray? And how should we pray in the church in the course of the divine liturgy? So in order to pray, we should first of all concentrate. First of all, without concentration, it is not a prayer. It is just actually talking. I'm sorry. As one saint says, it is actually offensive to God when a person is mumbling or singing the words of a prayer instead of actually praying. So, number one thing is full attention and concentration. The second thing is actually repentance. What can we pray about if we are so deeply ill? So we should be aimed at getting cured, first of all. What should we plead for? We should plead for actually getting saved and healed because we are unfortunately deeply ill. We have so many passions and sins. We can't help judging, envying, being greedy, getting taken offense. We can do nothing about vanity, envy, hypocrisy, and so on and so forth. So we have lots of things to pray for. So number one thing is concentration. Secondly, it is remorse or repentance. And third thing is, of course, reverence. Without these three basic conditions, it is self-deception, not prayer. So why do we live and very often we feel no changes in ourselves? It is very simple. We do not pray. How? I go to church. So what? We do not pray at all. This is a disaster. When we come to church, we do not pray either. At home, we start reading prayers, but not praying. It is a terrible self-deception. So much time we spend, especially the church goers. So many hours we spend in church. You can even actually calculate this hour in the course of the year. And how many times you actually prayed, you actually said, Lord, have mercy on me. It is a disaster. We substituted the prayer for this out of forms. It can't get any worse. It is killing for a person. You can be formally or technically orthodox in the course of all your life, but not in reality. You're not orthodox. In the course of the divine liturgy, if you understand the prayers, when a deacon says, Lord, oh, let's pray to Lord, let's pray to Lord, indeed, Lord, have mercy. But if you do not understand the prayer, if you can't tell what they are singing, we should pray with the prayer, as our Holy Father say, Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, have mercy on me. We should actually get used to this prayer. When someone starts doing it, they will understand that a service, a church service, goes by very fast. So we should make ourselves pray. It is hard work, but without hard work, nothing can be achieved. So you can't just come up to the piano and start playing the piano. In the same way, you can't just pray. So, and learning to pray is starting with this shortest prayer. Lord, have mercy on me. You should pray with a full attention, concentration, reverence, and remorse. You should try to do it a few times. And then a few times more, and all the time, and you should do it. And someone who starts actually doing it as often as possible, very soon will see how blessed they will be.
My friend is married for a year and she is suffering because she doesn't love her husband. She goes to church, prayers, prays, but it doesn't get better. She has no relief. Should she actually sacrifice her own happiness but stay married? Or should she get a divorce and go looking for real happiness? You know? This question is too serious, and I can't answer this note. It is impossible. It would be terrible if I said something. You should know these particular people. You should know the reasons why she doesn't love him. Maybe there is a third person involved. You see the ending of this question. Maybe she should go looking for happiness elsewhere. So this may be the reason of it. Here's what it is about. So I can't just answer it just as that. It is dangerous. You should know that if you got married, you should try as hard as possible in your family, to make your family a small church. You should start praying together in the evening if you can't do it in the morning. You should read one gospel of, one chapter of gospel. You should maybe read a life description of some saint or some writings of a saint. It would unite family a lot. It has a great meaning. Common reading, common literature. If you can't read Holy Fathers, you could read some secular literature. There are many interesting and useful books, but you should read together. But actually, it is very useful to read together some texts and literature which would help people to live in the Christian way. It is very, a very good rule. But in this form, I will not answer. I do not know who you are, who he is, the situation. If I answered, you would tell that I am a fool. You do not know and you speak. I am a fool, but I do not want to be called one. You are welcome. How can we understand the words? Who gives away their soul will save their soul. When we speak of soul and in gospel, the soul is understood is understood as our life, all our earthly prosperity, earthly interests, and our earthly ambitions. So we often say he has put all his soul in his business, for example, or in this sport, or somewhere else. So here is what we are talking about. You're welcome. Why is it so difficult to have good relationship with our own children when with people of our age we have no problems at all? You know, very often they ask me this question. It is a very frequently asked question. If you listen to my other lectures, I often Ask, why are we talking about our children but not about ourselves? The main reasons are inside ourselves. Our children cannot be all that difficult from, different from us. We want to communicate with our children, but our children do not want it. I understand that the street and the school have changed a lot in recent times, but I will tell you, if we managed in our family to create the conditions of the moral atmosphere, of a good atmosphere, if only we managed to do it, if children saw proper examples in ourselves, our relationship would be different. We do not set proper examples. We have many 
things we demand from our children, but we do not set proper examples. And that is the reason why we often have no contact with our children. Because all we care about is to feed our children, to provide for them physically, but we forget that the spiritual level is the main level of our life that defines everything. The prosperity gives no peace of soul. So the spiritual education is the number one priority. So there is no upbringing of a child where you know, there is no process of teaching a child to fight their desires, especially when these desires go against the gospel. We should teach a child to fight their desires. Only then a person can gradually fight their dislike or hate towards other people, to fight their irritation. Only like that. There is no other way, because the street will not give this. The internet will not give this. The school, unfortunately, can no longer give this either. So the last thing is family, and it is so important in family to have the atmosphere of peace, and the peace is only possible when based on the right moral foundation. This foundation is fighting with your bad ambitions, starting from some minor things, but you should get used to it. But when a child is always allowed to do everything, if they are taking something away, it is a disaster what is happening to them. They burst into tears and so on. So we do not actually bring our children up. We only care for providing for them. We only care for the physical side of life. So without Christianity, it is very difficult to bring up a person properly. How can we understand the blessed are the poor in spirit, as theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean, poor in spirit? It means my inner state. When I feel myself spiritually poor, I know what it means, poor in our physical life. I have no money, but in spiritual meaning means, what does it говорили? mean? We just talked about it, you know, I have so many sins and passions, вот вижу, and I can я, see that, I, I can see who ежик. I am indeed, ежик, I am живот, like то, a hedgehog, you иглами. touch a hedgehog, and it will prick you, the same with me. Победить. When I see that I can't overcome anything in my soul, I have a bad relationship with others because of it. I have health problems because of it. Because the Christian just says, do not overeat. But how can I do it? It is so tasty. How can I drink? Don't drink too much alcohol. What do we have? The holidays for and my neighbor. You know, he is just such a fraud, and he has such a nice car, and I'm an honest man, and I have just a regular car. You know, when I realize how honest I am, I can do anything good in reality. When I see how spiritually poor I am, as it turns out, this state, and together with the prayer to God, Lord, have mercy, please, here is a great state, because this is the touch point from which you will actually start getting cured, because in order to be cured, we need to see what we need to be cured from. 
because here is our disaster. There is nothing good inside ourselves. Really? There is nothing good inside me? I have so many good qualities, you know. This is the root of all evil. You know, Macarius the Great, who actually was called earthly God, great Lord, please purify me as sinful man, as never ever did I do anything good in front of you. You see, one of the greatest saints, he prays to God to have mercy on him. So what good do we do? Even if we help someone a little bit, and we have vanity and pride because of it, so what good do we actually do if we think seriously about it? So thinking seriously of it, we realize that we do nothing actually good. And this is a blessed state. And God will give spiritual, spiritual you know, fruit to this person, like peace and relief and so on. In one place, the New Testament says that the faith without good deeds is dead, and in, an, in a different place it is said vice versa. So this is a contradiction. What is more important, good deeds or faith? First are the words by Apostle Paul, and the second is by Apostle Jacob, the head of the, Jer of the Jerusalem Church. So they are writing in accordance with the state of people to whom they are writing. Apostle Paul says, he attracts attention to the Jewish law, Moses law, which was later expanded. There are now so many commandments, 613 commandments, as they say. And what kind of commandments? After going to the market, you should wash your hands. Someone came, washed the benches. On Saturday, don't carry anything. On Saturday, don't walk more than 1,500 kilometers. So this is just outer laws, and this was called as deeds. So Apostle Paul says these deeds cannot save a person who crucified Jesus Christ. Those people who actually stuck to these testaments and did everything exactly. But Jesus Christ said, you are like the painted coffins which shine on the outside but are full of bones and skulls inside. So this is what the words of Apostle Paul mean. We get saved by our faith. What does he mean? The Christian faith, which actually pays my attention, tracks my attention to the inner state of my soul, to fight in my own bad ambitions, dreams, passions, you know, no no one sees what is inside me, but I know what is inside me. I am full of these dirty things. Of course, of course we get saved with the faith, because I see how poor I am in spirit. Apostle Jacob tells of a different thing. He is writing about our merciful deeds. So are you indeed a believer? If a poor person came to you and has nothing to eat and you do not help them, so are you a believer? If you do not help a person in need, so it seems technically that this is a contradiction, but in reality it isn't. They both say the same thing, that actually our faith is realized by means of our actions and mercy, but we do not get saved with these deeds, because actually, as I said, we have a lot of 
vanity and pride because of it, but we get saved with our, with our will to follow the commandments. So, please explain to a five-year-old why should I be good? Very easily, when a five-year-old asks you for something, do not give him, and that's it, and he will understand why he should be good. Do you believe the sacraments of confession and the Holy Communion to be two separate sacraments? Do we have to necessarily confess before taking communion? You know, we take communion quite rarely, not every day, let alone, and not every week. So we have so many sins in the meanwhile. Uh, sometimes not just thoughts or even words, but often words and deeds. So it is necessary to confess before taking the communion. The confession makes us think about our soul makes us pray, ask for forgiveness, because confession is not just about coming up to a priest and reading all your sins like an accountant does, but it's actually about repenting and just naming the main things to a priest, not all, but the main ones. It is a very good practice, of course, these are two separate sacraments, but this is a very good practice that we still have in our church. I will tell you, in the West, I mean Catholics and Protestants, they do not have it, unfortunately, they do not have it. I remember that in the Cathedral of St. Paul, nobody confessed, so they could take communion, but they didn't want to confess. So we have this, this outer control which helps us with reverence to come up to the Holy Communion. It is not just something, you know, regular or mundane. So I think that confession before taking communion is very useful. I saw in some Orthodox churches not everyone goes to confession before taking the communion, and I believe it to be very sad. I understand when a person happens to take communion two or three times in the course of one week, and they didn't actually do anything bad. But we who take communion once, once per month, or even once in three months, we do need the confession, because we would punish ourselves if we do not follow this rule. So how should we teach people in a Sunday school? You know, it's not just about Sunday schools, but about the theological schools in general. In general, I also started in, a, in the Theological Academy. I know that the thing that we were told nothing about was the spiritual life. So I remember the history of church, canons, teachings, but nothing about the spiritual life, about the prayer, you know, about praying. There is some unbelievable thought that there is nothing to talk about. This is so important to explain this. And your own spiritual father, you, you need to have a spiritual father. Who is he? So our Saint John Climacus writes that before finding, before going to spiritual father, before naming someone your spiritual father, you should actually try them hard and even maybe you check them in every single way you possibly can in order not to find 
Call a shipwreck instead of salvation. This is so serious. You should be so careful. But unfortunately, in spiritual theological schools, very few attention is paid to this. I think this is the main mistake of this theological schools. And before the revolution, before the revolution, it was a disaster. You should read Metropolitan Benjamin Fetchenko, the book on edge of the two epochs, and you will see the state of the spiritual schools. You will say it is terrible. And in revolution in which many students of the theological schools even participated. So I think that in Sunday schools we should teach people to pray, how to pray. This is the first essential condition. What did the bandit know from teaching? He knew nothing, and he was the first one to enter paradise. Do you see how the spiritual state is important? And the spiritual state is not about knowledge. It is not about knowledge. All this theological knowledge are just, just some things that can help. But many things that we study will never help us in our spiritual life. The first thing we should know is how to pray, how to fast, how we should, how we should confess what good things are, what exploits we should have, how we should choose a spiritual father. So these are the main questions. But Aside from the spiritual questions, everything else is secondary. We should study that, but it is secondary. And we should pay our attention to this in both Sunday schools and in theological seminary and academy and so on and so forth. Demons do not just believe. They know everything. They know all the theology better than all professors in the world. But they remain demons. Do you understand? And we often forget we, the professors. We often do not understand this. We keep teaching and teaching all these minor things. Who was born in what year? Who got baptized in what year? And then the changes in history and uh, some minor things in teaching. But how to pray? Just pray. Oh, it is so great. Just pray. We're so smart. Come up to the piano and play the piano. We do not understand these elementary things. So this should be paid attention to. But in order to pay attention to this, a teacher should learn what it is. Because God forbid, if a teacher knows nothing and actually teaches someone Else. This will be terrible. This will be a disaster for their students. Like brain. Can we imagine Jesus Christ, the Virgin Mary? Catholic saints say, yes, of course, imagine our saints unanimously cry, no way, never. You will pray to your fantasy, but not to God. This is the greatest difference. I'm just providing you a simple example. So a teacher should learn everything. First, they should read Ignati Brinchininov or Nikon Varabyov, who explained Ignati Brinchininov to the modern reader, and then a teacher will be able to teach students what they should know. Do you know Maslenikov? Who has the school of remorse? What do you know about it? 
This is a very sad thing. He often talks about Ignatiev Brinchinina, if it is curious. But you know, this person actually picks something and explains this, perverting it so much that he contradicts to Ignatiev Brinchinina. If you write your sins and then you start fighting sins and having, having overcome your sin, cross it out. And when you cross out everything, you say, oh God, I can be canonized alive. This is a disaster. This is actually this is a contradiction. Holy Father saying, I can't actually do anything properly, not a single commandment. I never did anything good, Macarius the Great says. And here I can cross out. It is unbelievable. Who can do this? Who can stop talking in vain? Who can stop envying? When I sleep, I can... I can not judge my neighbors, but then I awake and I can't. You know, so he is a person who doesn't understand many things. So in Yekaterinburg, on a lecture, I was asked about him, and I told the same thing. When you do not understand something, please do not tell anybody anything. Do not teach. Do not not quote saints perverted да. and explain вот it vice versa. This is a disaster. So please do not listen to him. Ну, хорошо, okay, thank большое. you very much. Our time is over. So I wish you to spend the rest of the fast very well. Thank you.